یو ایس ہاؤس ڈیموکریٹک لیڈر حکیم جیفریز آن ویڈنس ڈے کالڈ آن ہاؤس ریپبلکنس ٹو بریک وتھ ایکسٹریم ونگ آف دیئر پارٹی اینڈ ورک وتھ ڈیموکریٹس ٹو اوائڈ ڈیفالٹ اٹ ڈز اپیئر انکریزنگلی لائکلی دیٹ ہاؤس ریپبلکنس وانٹ اے ڈینجرس ڈیفالٹ جیفریز سیڈ ایٹ اے نیوز کانفرنس آن کیپیٹل ہل House Democrats have provided a vehicle to end this reckless and dangerous default crisis and avoid the economy crashing. Moderate Republicans have said they want to avoid a dangerous default, find common ground with Democrats, and avoid a job-killing recession. It's now time for House Republicans to break with the extreme wing of their party and join House Democrats to put an end to the default crisis. The failure of five House Republicans to do so will simply reinforce the point that at the end of the day, what they really want is for America to default. House Republicans have the opportunity to prove that that is not the case. And let's see what happens on the floor this afternoon or tomorrow. One of the things that I will continue to communicate to the White House is that it's not clear to me that the extreme MAGA Republicans in the House are having these discussions in good faith. It does appear increasingly likely that House Republicans want a dangerous default, they want to crash the economy, and they want to trigger a job-killing recession. It's my hope that five Republicans from New York or California or other moderate districts throughout the country can prove me wrong, prove us wrong, and they now have an opportunity to do so, just five, by signing a discharge petition that can end this madness right now. Negotiators for Democratic Welcome President Joe Biden and top Congressional Republican Kevin McCarthy held what both sides called productive talks on Wednesday to try to reach a deal to raise the United States' $31.4 trillion debt ceiling and avoid a catastrophic default. After a four-hour White House meeting, McCarthy said negotiations had improved and would continue in the evening. He predicted the two sides would reach an agreement, though several issues remain unresolved. We try to finish out the negotiations with the White House. There's a number of places that we are still far apart. I mean, it didn't seem like it'd be this hard. But first of all, let me tell the American public, I am not going to give up. We're not going to default. We're going to solve this problem. I will stay with it until we can get it done. White House spokesperson Kenin Jaapekh said talks remain fruitful. But the White House and Congressional Democrats also accused Republicans of taking the economy hostage to advance an agenda that could otherwise not pass. They said Republicans need to make more concessions as they will need Democratic votes to pass any deal. Good afternoon, everybody. Averting default is the responsibility of every single member of Congress. Think about what's at stake here. And that's what we've been doing. We've been laying out for weeks, for months, what is at stake. A default would have catastrophic impacts in every single part of this country, whether you're in a red state or in a blue state. It doesn't matter. Every single part of the country. We're talking about millions of jobs lost, devastated retirement accounts, and a recession. We're, we've also heard some House Republicans refer to preventing default as the only concession they are willing to make. But preventing a catastrophic default is not a concession. It's their job, period. The Speaker himself has publicly acknowledged that for any agreement to pass the House, the Senate, and to reach the desk of the President, it's going to need support from Democrats. That is the reality that we're in. 
The president's team will continue to negotiate in good faith to reach a reasonable bipartisan budget agreement. That's what the president and the speaker agreed to, and that's what they tasked their teams with reaching from this outset. Negotiations, the way that we see them, remain uh, productive. As you know, they are meeting right now in, at OMB uh, with, uh, with, the, with the House negotiators. The president and the speaker will speak uh, when, uh, when the time is right, when the time is necessary to do that. We are giving, I've said this moments ago, we're going to have, give the negotiators some time uh, to have a conversation, to continue to negotiate. We believe uh, the talks are moving in a productive way, and so I'll leave it there. What well, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who had $183,000 of her own business loans forgiven, vote to deny debt relief to the 92,000 student borrowers she represents. Will, will Representative Vern Buchanan, who had over $2.3 million of business loans forgiven, vote to deny student debt relief for 95,000 of his own constituents? To the more than 40 million eligible student borrowers who are eagerly waiting to learn about the fate of their debt relief, I urge you to tune in today's vote, into today's vote, to watch which Republican lawmakers shamelessly vote against debt relief for you after having their own loans forgiven that he's had folks i will see you tomorrow time is running short as the treasury department has warned the federal government could be unable to pay all its bills by as soon as june 1 just eight days away and it will take several days to pass legislation through the narrowly divided congress it's highly likely that we would run out of resources to meet all the government's obligations in early June and possibly as early as June 1st. Um, so uh, we no longer see very much likelihood um, that our resources will enable us um, to get to the middle or end of June. Treasury and President Biden will face very tough choices if Congress doesn't act to raise the debt ceiling. And um, if, if we hit the so-called X date without that occurring, um, there will be some obligations um, that we will be unable to pay. I think the most important thing to recognize is that we must raise the debt ceiling. There isn't any outcome um, that is acceptable uh, we will default on some obligation. And um, that's really not an acceptable state of affairs. It threatens um, the strong recovery that we have in the US economy. It threatens financial markets. And um, we simply have to raise the debt ceiling. Well, let me tell the American public. McCarthy has insisted that any deal must not, not raise taxes and must problem. cut discretionary spending, not hold it done. steady but as Biden has proposed. We have to spend less than we spent last year. It is not my fault that the Democrats cannot give up on their spending. The Look, there, there's differences. We know where it's at. You have to spend less than you spent last year. That's not that difficult to do. But in Washington, somehow, that is a problem. They have increased spending with the Democrats in the majority on discretionary spending by more than 33 percent. No household's been able to afford to do that. We can find waste. We can eliminate that. The president eliminated a lot of places that we can't talk about, so I've got a short area to do it, but we found a reasonable way to do it. Mr. Speaker, so it's Mr. not Speaker. that... Look, I think we can make progress today. I'm hoping that we can make progress. Mr. Speaker, Mr. I apologize. I got, I got to open up the House. I appreciate spending time with you. We'll continue to keep you updated as we go. And I look, I look forward to the days. Of, thank you all very much. Any deal that Biden and McCarthy reach will have a narrow path for passage through the divided Congress. Where McCarthy's Republicans hold a 222 over 213 House majority and well, Biden's Democrats did. control the Senate by a 51 over 49 margin. The lack of progress has heightened concerns that Congress could inadvertently trigger a crisis by failing to act in time. Well, to be frank, I think it's quite ridiculous that we're doing this again.
right? I feel like it just shows the rest of the world how dysfunctional our government has been over the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, in my eyes, we're playing Russian roulette with the United States credit. And it shouldn't even be an option. And I don't even know why we continue to allow this to happen where we're, you know, just allowing, uh, you know, these congressmen and senators and these politicians, again, to wreak havoc or to kind of play uh, with the, the, the good standing credit of the United States of America. Just as a reminder that Washington, D.C. can teach Hollywood a thing or two about drama that the uh, the parties are constantly battling with one another to get attention from the voters. But in the end, I think that cooler minds will prevail and that we will not fall into uh, a credit crisis or default on our debt. Excuse my French, they're a little pissed off, right? Because we've just gone through a pandemic. We've had inflation that was at 40 year highs. We had a market, the, the NASDAQ market that dropped 30% last year, the S&P 500 dropped 20%. And we have the Fed finally starting to, you know, the, the rate hikes that they've done over the last 18 months is finally starting to do exactly what's needed to be done. And we saw that in the market. The market has rallied off the, the bottoms, but now it's creating uncertainty. Any investor does not like uncertainty. And this, this, this debt ceiling debate is bringing and leading uncertainty in the market. And that's making it very frustrating to investors. Just think about it. Where do you put your money right now and feel comfortable? Well, I, I think that they are in some ways breathing a sigh of relief that uh, the U.S.'s government has a hard time coming to an agreement the way many other countries uh parliaments or chambers uh, have a hard time coming to an agreement. But I think that they will uh, also believe that cooler minds will prevail um, because there is an awful lot of credibility to be lost should we end up defaulting on our debt. Uh, the U.S. is the world's reserve currency, but should we do something stupid like default on our debt or even threaten to do so, uh, then I think that's going to cause a lot of international business people to look for an alternative currency, and that is not in our best interest. At the end of the day, as a hedge fund manager, we're risk managers. We want to obviously take risk and, and make money. But we're also trying to preserve our capital. And, and when you have that anomaly out there, right, that black swan event that could happen, there's, there's a possibility that it could happen where, you know, it really makes you take a back seat and say to yourself, hey, I'm going to stay a little bit more in cash or I'm not going to make that investment right now. Or when news comes out, that's why you're seeing really big price uh, moves in the S&P 500 is because you have like, you know, what happened on Friday. Uh, you know, we you, you had information come out that the, the talks have broken down and the market sells off and then talks are back on, the market starts rallying up and that makes it extremely difficult. Well, what I would like to see is uh, a an agreement on both sides to raise the debt ceiling, but an effort to reduce the overall debt and deficit uh, that this country has been digging itself into. It's going to become more and more expensive as interest rates remain elevated. And we, we really just can't continue to spend the way we are now. Um, what I would like uh, is for this agreement to be made because then it avoids a repeat of 2011 in which the S&P fell 19.5% accompanied by all styles, all sizes, and all sectors within the S&P 500. At the end of the day, I believe we're going to get it done. But you have to be always protect your capital. So what we're doing right now is we're sitting on our hands. We're waiting to see how this plays out by the end of the week. And by the end of the week, we will get a lot more information out of these two sides. So, you know, just, you know, stay the course. And Again, if you're a long-term investor, we're much short-term investors at our fund, but if you're a long-term investor, if we start to go into technical default, basically meaning we're going to get it we're going to get it done, but we're not going to get it done in a timely manner. We might have a sell-off and that might bring opportunities. So, if you're a longer-term investor, 
look for those opportunities. If you're in certain sectors that you in your you enjoy and you want to own more of it and it's had a big move again, that could be your opportunity to deploy some capital. Uh, I believe that at least what we could find is that there will be an extension, <laughs> just like an extension of filing your taxes, that the U.S. government will sort of kick the can down the road and uh, make a decision on the debt ceiling when it approves the budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Uh, um, so I would say that should we get an extension and then an agreement, uh, the market will rally quite nicely. We will end up seeing the uh, growth areas as well as the cyclical sectors in positive territory. And we will end up seeing the safe havens or the defensive groups like consumer staples, healthcare, and utilities being laggards. We should not have a debt ceiling where the Congress is going to put us in, in jeopardy of defaulting on what we owe to, to uh, retirees, to other governments. It just puts... It, it it just puts us in a situation where it's bad. We if we defaulted, we'd have higher interest rates. It would hurt our standing in the world economy as the reserve currency. The dollar would I mean it would bring market turmoil. So I you know to me I think you need to change the law if you want to have a budget argument. We'll do it in Congress, but don't put the debt ceiling or us not allowing us to pay our bills. That, that should just be an automatic that the U.S. government should pay its bills no matter what. Well, if we end up in a default situation, uh, the only example that we can really fall back on is what happened in 2011. Uh, from April 29th through October 3rd, the S&P 500 fell 19.4%. All sizes, meaning large cap, mid cap, small cap, as well as growth and value, and the 11 sectors in the S&P 500 fell in price uh, we also had 117 of the sub-industries in negative territory. Uh, only gold, electric utilities, and restaurants were positive, uh, and a good 84% of these sub-industries posted double-digit declines. So while we'll probably take a downward-sloping escalator uh, until we reach that critical early June timeframe, if we do not come to an agreement, that escalator will turn into the down elevator. You know, when you look back to our founding fathers and the way they created the Constitution of America, they didn't want a president to be a king or a queen. And what we have in the Congress and Senate is where we have these many kings and queens because they're sitting there for 20, 30, 40 years and you, there's no accountability. What does the American public have right now that can get a lot of these entrenched senators and congressmen out? It's really hard, especially because of, of special interest groups. So the way you stop it is you put term limits on, on these congressmen and senators, and you'll see, we'll get new fresh blood, right? They'll have to get things done in order to keep their job for another, another term and make it two terms. If these people, these representatives spent as, half as much time on focusing on our problems as they do trying to mess up the other side, uh, we would have a lot fewer problems. The U.S. House of Representatives will go on recess on Thursday, May 25. As planned and members will be given 24 hours notice to return to Washington if a deal on raising the debt limit is reached. U.S. House Majority Leader said on Wednesday.